Hey, what's going on? We're out here at Bracken Ridge Park having a good time, enjoying some sunlight. Enjoying sitting together and fellowshipping together. Yes, and we wanted to encourage you to do that because as you can see, we're standing by this tree. And as the word says, that you will be like trees planted by rivers of living water. We have a great word in store for you. So we just want you to come and enjoy the word of God. Tell your friends, share, 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 and share again. It's going to be great. Also, we have coming towards you. We're going to worship the Lord. So get ready to get your hands up to give God some praise because it's about to be a wonderful day.
This word is for the body. The Lord says, it would be an unfair of me to place my people in a situation that would be too much for them. And he says, my grace is upon you. And he said, my grace is my divine influence upon the heart of my people. He said that my grace is my strength upon my people to overcome, to dismantle, to overtake everywhere that they go. My people should have their feet on the enemy's neck. And the Lord says, have I not said, come boldly before my throne of grace and obtain grace and mercy in the time of need? And the Lord says, no matter what you face, come boldly to my throne of grace and obtain grace from me to overcome every situation that you face. The Lord says, there is nothing that you can face that's too much for me. He says, some things you face may be too much for you, but if you would come before me, and obtain my grace. I will give you the strength, the influence that you need to overcome every given situation. He says that you are my people. My strength is in you. He says, speaking of the people of the old days and the children of Israel, everywhere they went, they overcame obstacles. They faced giants. They destroyed things that were impossible for them to do. But because they had the Spirit of God with them, they did many uh, my, wonderful things. And the Lord says that my Spirit wasn't in them. My Spirit was upon them to accomplish a task. But the Lord says that my Spirit is in you. You are filled with my Spirit. You have my grace, says the Lord. The Lord says, overcome, overtake. You are my peculiar people to overcome all that you face because my presence is in you, says the Lord. This is also what I heard from the body is, is a man makes a plan, but I guide his steps. And the Lord says, as a river runs through nature, it supplies what it needs to the area. And it supplies nourishment, um, and it supplies what it needs for that area and for that um, atmosphere. And the Lord says, as the river goes through, the Lord says, I guide where it needs to supply. I will guide where it needs to supply. And the Lord says, there might be diversions here and there, but the Lord says, I have a plan and a place and a strategy of, of what needs to be supplied when it needs to be supplied. And the Lord says, just trust the process, trust the flow, says the Lord. Because as I'm flowing, the Lord says, I'm guiding. Uh, still make the plans, but the Lord says, I will guide you along the way. Good morning. The title of today's message is Prisoner or Prime Minister. Prisoner or Prime Minister. And the subtitle is, if you don't like your latitude, you may need to check your attitude. If you're in a place in life and you don't like where you're at and you find that you can't get out of there, chances are it's tied to something going on with your attitude. To start with today, I want to talk a little bit about something that I used to call uh, the laws of the universe. And I refer to it now as the order of things. And the order of things really encompasses everything about the nature of God. We know that he's a God of order. He creates order in the physical realm. We know from the laws of gravity and all of the other physical laws that operate in extreme precision. But there's also laws that govern what goes on with relationships and things in the spiritual world. And the order of things is very important to God. A great example of this is the fall of man. When God created Adam, he said that he created Adam in his image and gave him dominion over the earth. And so when Adam sinned and fell under the law of sin and death, then everything that Adam had dominion over, including all of the earth and all of his descendants, fell under that same curse of law and death. This is why you and I were originally born with a sin nature. Now sometimes God expresses the law of things or the, the order of things in different ways. And scripture is full of God's expressions regarding the order of things. Sometimes he expresses things straightforward in law, and the Ten Commandments are good examples of that. For example, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. At other times, God expresses the order of things and ties it to a consequence. 
The book of Proverbs is full of many examples of this. For example, in Proverbs 119, so are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes the way of the life of its owners. So God is telling us that if we're all caught up and consumed with the greed for gain, that process will take away our very life. Another example comes from Proverbs 132. For the turning away of the simple will slay them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Now, when Scripture talks about the simple or naive, God is referring to those who hold on to a childlike view of things and refuse to grow up. And because they don't grow up, they don't change their mindset, they really don't get a good grasp on the order of things. And as we'll see today, this holding on to a childlike view of things and a refusal to grow up can cost us greatly. I love the way the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man or an adult, I put away childish things. So get the connection here. If we think like children and we understand things like children, we cannot help but speak and behave like children. It flows naturally from our character. But Paul says that when we become adults, when we mature, we put aside childish things. So there is an expectation from God and clearly an expectation in Scripture that we are to mature and that we are to grow up in our understanding of things. Another way in which God expresses the order of things is tying it to an expectation or an incentive to do what is right. For example, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So God is telling us if you want a long life, the key to that is honoring your father and your mother. Another example from Proverbs 3.9 and for me, this is the foundational scripture when in terms of tithes and offering. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. So God is telling us the keys to prosperity lie in honoring God with the first fruits of all of your gain. When we tithe, when we make our offerings to the Lord, we are honoring God and we are stipulating that we're putting our trust in God. So the question that I have for today is, how do we respond when things don't go the way that we expect them to? When we're doing what we think God wants us to do, but the outcome is not what we expect. How do we respond? Do we respond in faith? Do we respond in trusting God? Or do we respond in frustration? You know, do we get to the point where we're frustrated and we say, Lord, God, what's going on here? I don't understand. I've done what you've asked me to do. Why is this happening? And if we're not careful, our frustration can escalate and we begin to assign wrong motives to God. God, I did what you asked me to do. Why aren't you keeping up your end of the bargain? And we get angry and we get frustrated and that can mount even into demands. Lord, this is what you told me to do. You promised you were going to bring this to pass. You need to make it happen. Now I'll tell you now that the way in which we respond is governed by one important principle and that is the quality of our relationship with the Father. You see if we're walking with the Lord on a regular basis if we're staying in touch with Him, and if we know the heart of God, when troubles come along and when things don't turn out the way that we expect them to, we will tend to trust in Him and lean on Him. We can say, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. Please help me out of this situation. And if there's anything I'm doing that's preventing me from moving forward, please reveal it to me so that I can repent of it and change my ways. But if we're not walking with the Lord, if we're not consistently developing that re relationship, we will tend to get frustrated. Think about those examples. If we're demanding and we want something now, it's like we're saying, you know, I didn't ask to be here. You created me. I'm your responsibility and I expect you to keep your word. 
Isn't that how children respond? Sometimes we can cloak it a little bit. Instead of getting outright angry and making demand, we can say, well, I guess it's not going to happen, Lord. You know, just another example of being disappointed. God's always promising and never delivering. I never get what I ask for. But it's the same sin of unbelief. What we're saying is, I trust God that has power, but I don't really believe he's going to make this thing right. So the key to how we get through these things really resides within our attitude. So I can tell you that the first key concept we want to look at here is that there's a world of difference between an expectation and a demand. A world of difference between an expectation and a demand. Let's look at what Webster says about a demand. A demand is an insisting and commanding request made as if by right. So we have an entitlement mentality and we're demanding that something go our way or demanding that God deliver what he promised. Again, this is what children do when they don't get their way. But an expectation is different. An expectation is, divine, is, is defined as a strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. Now that sounds a lot like faith. What is faith? Well, faith is the belief that God will come through. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now think about those two words, substance and, ev and evidence. Substance implies something concrete, something that you can put your hands on. And evidence implies something that's factual that can be proven. And so what we're saying is that our faith, through the power of our faith, we are actually believing and seeing something of substance, something real in the heavenlies that can be factually verified as evidence. And through the process of our faith and trusting God, that will be pulled out of the spiritual and manifested in the physical. But this is the power of faith. But an expectation of faith is quite different from a demand. So today we want to look at two situations from Scripture. We want to look at a situation, first of all, where the people encountered some minor inconveniences and yet never got out of their childish demands, never really embraced the concept of growing up, and it cost them dearly. And we'll contrast that with the story of someone who faced significant challenges, and yet never wavered in his faith, never blamed God, and the outcome of that was spectacular. So we'll begin our story today with the children of Israel, specifically the children of Israel in the Exodus out of Egypt. Now we know the story very well. The children of Israel were in Egypt. They had come to Egypt at the end of a great famine and over a course of years they had multiplied and become uh, great in number and great in strength. And the Egyptians were afraid of that. They said they'd become far too numerous, far too powerful, they may turn against us or worse yet they may side with one of our enemies and combine with one of our enemies to feed us. And so they began to treat the, the, um, the Israelites very harshly. They subjected them to hard labor and oppressed them terribly. And this went on for quite some time. Moses, who had been raised in Pharaoh's house, had gotten angry one day and killed an Egyptian because he was oppressing the Israelites, and he fled from Egypt. And for many, many years he was hiding on the backside of the desert, thinking that everything was done for him, until God appears to him and says, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. And God outlines his plan. After a significant amount of pushback and hesitation, Moses eventually accepts God's plan for his life, and he goes to Egypt to do what God had called him to do. Now, the first thing Moses does is he goes and meets with the leaders of Israel, and he reveals to them what the plan is. God is sending me to deliver you. I'm going to confront Pharaoh. He's going to harden his heart, but God is going to break him and the children of Israel are going to be delivered out of bondage. So both the leaders of Israel and all of the people backed Moses' plan 100%. And 
And we know what happens. Moses goes, and the more he pushes on Pharaoh, the harder Pharaoh oppresses the people. God begins to send plagues, and finally with the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh is broken, and the Egyptian people are, are broken, and Pharaoh gives the order, set the Israelites free and let them go. Now you have to get the picture in Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. As they're leaving Egypt, the Egyptians are running up to them and giving them silver and gold and jewelry and fine clothing. They are basically looting Egypt as they leave. The children or the, the people of Egypt are giving them all of their wealth as they leave. These are the same people who 12 hours earlier were beating them in the fields, now are begging them to leave and giving them their wealth as they go. So the children of Israel leave under Moses' leadership, and they travel through the wilderness for several days, and eventually they come to the Red Sea, and they camp there. And while they're camping there, they look back, and they see the Egyptians pursuing them. Now, even though they had signed off on this plan, and even though they had agreed with what Moses was going to do, what God was going to do through Moses, from the very start, they become overcome with fear. And they begin to cry out to Moses, and they begin to say, why have you led us out here in the wilderness just to be slaughtered? It would have been better had we stayed in Egypt. Now, they've only been delivered for a few days, and already they've forgotten the oppression of where they were as prisoners and as slaves and their fear is overtaking their good sense. So they look back on the heights of the hills, and sure enough, the Egyptians have changed their mind. Pharaoh and all of his armies are pursuing them. So in their fear, they cry out, and God miraculously creates darkness over the Egyptians so that they cannot find the Hebrews. And after giving instructions to Moses, God parts the Red Sea and all of Israel marches through on dry land. Now get the picture here. You've got columns of water 40, 80 feet tall on either side. And in the middle is dry ground. It's not even damp, it's bone dry. And this is not a narrow path. By the time the children of Israel are delivered from Egypt, they have swelled in numbers to more than a million. This is a very, very large group of people. So the parting of the sea, the pathway was very, very wide and very long. And so the children of Israel begin to march through the sea on dry ground. As they get to the other side and they come out, they turn around and look, and the Egyptians are beginning to descend into this dry ground that used to be the sea, and they're in hot pursuit. And as the last Egyptian comes down into the dry ground through this big path, God closes the water on both sides and drowns all the Egyptians. Nowhere else do we see such a dramatic demonstration of God delivering a people and destroying their enemies right before their eyes. And you would think that having lived through that experience, that it would make an indelible impression in the minds of the children of Israel and that they would always trust God and never doubt him again. But that wasn't the case. Have you ever been in a situation in your life and you say to yourself or you say to God, you say, Lord, if you'll just do this mighty miracle, if you'll just do this thing that I'm asking, I'll never doubt you again. You start bargaining, I'll never doubt you again. Well, don't be so sure. So the enemies are destroyed, the children of Israel continue their march into the wilderness. And after they march for a while, they encamp. And there they stay for almost a year. And all during that time, God is giving them a new identity. He downloads to them through Moses all of the law in the rest of Exodus into Leviticus and Numbers. A law that encompasses everything. It's an entirely new society. It's an entirely new set of rules for living. It governs everything from the way you treat the land to the way you treat your animals to the way you treat strangers in your land. An entire new identity. And all this time, over and over again, God is repeating to them, I am setting you apart to be a holy people, a royal priesthood. 
And the reason that I'm doing this is I'm going to lead you into the promised land, the land that I promised your father Abraham. I'm going to lead you in, in a mighty army. You're going to drive out the inhabitants of the land and you're going to occupy the land that I promised to your father Abraham. And sure enough, the time comes after a year of recuperating and being given this whole new identity that God tells Moses, get the people up to march and get them ready. We're heading into the promised land. Well, all during this time, from the time they cross the Red Sea until the time they get to the very border of the promised land, the children of Israel complain about every little thing that goes wrong. First, they come to a land where there's no water and they begin to whine and complain that there's no water. And over and over they get over and over again they say why did you lead us out of Egypt just to bring us here to die of thirst or to die of starvation oh that we were all back into Egypt where there was plenty of water and pots of meat and leeks and garlic and life was good they've completely forgotten the slavery and the bondage that they were under and now that they've encountered a little bit of adversity instead of handling it like adults Instead of bucking up under the pressure, and instead of turning to God, they whine and complain. When they got to a land where there was no water, they could have stopped. They could have fallen on their face before the Lord and said, Lord God, we know that you've led us out here. We know that you are a provider. We know that you will provide water. We will just simply sit here and wait, knowing that you will provide. They could have done an act of faith, but instead they whine. They whine about having no water. They whine again about having no meat. From the time they crossed the Red Sea until the day they entered the Promised Land, God gave them manna from the sky. They would get up every morning and this food would be lying on the ground. And they would gather it up, enough for one day, and no one would ever go hungry. But they got tired of eating the same food and they begged and begged for meat. And so finally, God sends in quail. He gets so tired of the complaining that he sends in quail, stacked about that high all around the camp. And the Bible says while they were still eating, while the meat was still in their teeth, God sent out a plague among them. Of course, Moses prays for them and, and, the, and the plague gets checked. But God is continually showing them that he's not pleased with this constant whining and complaining. And yet they still don't get the picture. So finally, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, they get to the very border of the promised land. They get to the very edge and they're about to go in and God tells Moses, send some spies in. So they send in a group of spies and they spy out the land. And the land is flowing with milk and honey and the spies come back and 10 of the spies say, oh yes, it's flowing with milk and honey, but the people are powerful. Their cities are strongly fortified and the people are giants. We look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Only two came back, Caleb and Joshua, that said, hey, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but these other obstacles are nothing because God has declared it's ours. It's ours. We need to go in and occupy it as the Lord has said. But the people were overcome with their fear. So here's the second big point. If you're not trusting God, if you're not developing that relationship with God, if you're not walking with Him on a regular basis, when the opportunity comes for the big blessing and deliverance in your life, you're not going to recognize it. They were on the very verge of entering into the promised land, something that Abraham and everyone since Abraham had been waiting for, and their fear and their commitment to thinking and feeling and believing and acting like a child kept them out. In fact, they were so set on not going in that they developed a plan. They were gonna stone Moses, stone Caleb, and stone Joshua, elect a new leader, and march right back to slavery in Egypt. At this point, God had had enough. He calls Moses to him, and in his anger, he says, Moses, that's it. I'm going to destroy them all. Ten times since I've delivered them, they have tested me. Ten times I have given them an opportunity to trust me in faith, and they have rejected it. And enough is enough. I'm going to destroy them. 
Now, I love Moses because Moses had been walking with God. Moses had maintained his relationship with God, and Moses knew the heart of God. And so Moses appeals. He intercedes on their behalf, and he says, Lord, I get it. I know you're angry, but you can't wipe them out. Think of what would happen if you did. All the world would say, God was not able to complete what he started. And you know, Lord God, the reason that you're doing this is to set a people apart for yourself, to be a city on a hill that would draw all nations unto you. You can't abort your plan, Lord. And the Lord listens to him. He says, okay, Moses, I won't wipe them out, but here's the deal. Not one of them will enter the promised land. Only Caleb and Joshua will go in, but the rest of the adults, they are gonna wander in the wilderness for 40 years until they die, and not one of them will enter into the promised land. That is a serious, serious consequence for not trusting God and for not giving up a childish mindset of things and for not being willing to mature and embrace faith and trust God during our difficulties. So now that we've seen how not to do it, let's take a look at a good example of how to do it. And for that, we want to take a look at the life of Joseph. Now, Joseph came from a very dysfunctional family situation. Joseph's father was Jacob. Jacob means deceiver, and Jacob clearly lived up to his name. Twice, Jacob deceived his older brother, once out of his birthright and once out of the blessing for the oldest. In fact, Jacob impersonated his older brother and went into his elderly father, who was blind, and deceived his father into thinking that he was Esau, and his father, Isaac, gives him the blessing that should have gone to the older brother, Esau. And of course, Jacob eventually flees because he's sure that Esau now is going to kill him. But before he flees, his father says to him, what's done is done. You need to find a wife. Don't find a wife among foreigners. I want you to go to the land of your mother's family and there find a member of her family and take her as a wife. So Jacob listens to his father and he goes to the land of his mother and there he encounters Rachel and he falls in love with Rachel as soon as he sees her, sees her and he follows her home and he discovers that she is the daughter of his mother's brother, Laban. So that's his uncle. And so he tells his uncle, I'm in love with Rachel. I want to marry her. I will work for you for seven years in exchange for having Rachel as my wife. And Laban says, it's a deal. So Jacob works for seven years. And at the end of seven years, he comes to Laban and says, I've completed my work. Please now may I have my wife. And uh, Laban says, sure, great. So they have this huge party, this big celebration. The wine is flowing. Everybody's having a great time. It's long after dark. Jacob goes into the bridal tent, he sleeps with his wife, and he wakes up in the morning to discover that it's not Rachel, indeed it's Leah, her older sister. Jacob runs out of the tent, he finds Laban, and he cries out to him, what is this deception that you've done to me? Did I not work seven years for Rachel? Why have you done this to me? And Laban says, yeah, about that. So we have this custom that I can't really marry off the younger daughter unless I've already married the older daughter. So here's what I'm going to do. Keep Leah as your wife. Finish your customary week with her. And if you agree to work with me for another seven years, work for me for another seven years, I'll give you Rachel as well. And so Jacob agrees. Now you have to think that perhaps Jacob realized that there was a bit of what comes around goes around here. That he was actually reaping what he had sowed. Here he is deceiving his older brother on several occasions and now he himself has been deceived. And so Jacob agrees and he marries Rachel and Leah. Now you have to imagine this situation. You have two women, sisters, married to the same man. He clearly loves one and not the other. 
That is not a recipe for a happy household. Indeed, Leah, the wife he doesn't love, begins to have children almost immediately. And after she's had several children and Rachel is unable to have children, Rachel can't take it any longer. So she takes her handmaid, brings her to her husband and says, here, sleep with my husband and my husband will produce children for me through her. So Jacob listens to his wife. He sleeps with her maidservant and sure enough, she gets pregnant and has a couple of children. At the same time, Leah stops having children. Not to be outdone, she grabs her handmaid, brings her to Jacob and says, sleep with my servant and she will continue to produce children for me on my behalf. And so Jacob listens to his other wife, sleeps with her handmaid and produces children from her. And after all of these shenanigans, Rachel finally is able to have children and she gives birth to Joseph. And the scripture says sometimes later, sometime later, she also became pregnant and gave birth to Benjamin and she dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. So as the story of Joseph's life, life begins to unfold, we find this very dysfunctional situation. He has all these brothers, but they're half brothers. You know, the 12 tribes of Israel come from these men and they're all half brothers and they don't like each other. And in particular, they don't like Joseph. Joseph is the youngest. Benjamin is around, but Benjamin's far too small. And so all the interaction now is with these brothers, with Joseph being the youngest. And all the other brothers, there are more than one brother from a particular mother, but Joseph is the only mother of Rachel. And everyone in the family knew that Rachel was the wife that Jacob loved. To make matters worse, to make matters worse, Jacob actually favors this younger son. The scripture says he loved this son of his own age. And Jacob makes a very particular festive coat for Joseph to wear. And his brothers are very jealous of this. And they're upset because contrary to culture, uh, Jacob isn't, he isn't honoring the oldest son, he's honoring the youngest son. And then finally, what really tips the scales is that Joseph begins to have a series of prophetic dreams and he's just young enough and just foolish enough that he shares them with his brothers. Hey brothers, I had this wonderful dream. We're all out working in the field. We're gathering wheat. And as we put the sheaves together, my sheave stands up in the middle and all of your sheaves gather around and bow down. <laughs> his brothers were indignant. And then he has another dream. Now it's all the stars bowing down as well as the sun and the moon, representing his mother and father. And so his father rebukes him, but he ponders carefully what the meaning of these dreams might be. And the brothers have had it. In fact, the scripture says they hated him all the more. And so finally they get their chance. They're out working in the fields. They are tending the sheep. Joseph is at home with his father and Joseph sends him to go check on his brothers. So Joseph goes to check on his brothers and they see him coming from a distance and they say to one another, now's our chance to get rid of this dreamer. Let's kill him and get rid of him once and for all. To his credit, Reuben, the oldest brother, doesn't want to do it. He still has respect for his father even though he hasn't been honored in the traditional way and he does not want them to take his life. And so he tells them, look, instead of taking his life and having his blood on our hands, let's put him in this empty well over here. We'll just drop him in here and whatever comes of him comes of him. We didn't kill him. We don't know what happened to him and we just go on our way. And the brothers agree to this plan. Satisfied with that, Reuben goes off about his business. But while he's gone, a caravan comes through. And the rest of the brothers say, oh, this is even better. Now he doesn't even have to die. We don't even have to have that on our conscience. What we'll do is we'll just sell him as a slave to these, to these merchants and we'll be done with him forever. And so they do. They sell him to the merchants coming through. Reuben comes back. He sees that the well is empty. He tears his clothes. He knows that this is going to kill his father. And he's beside himself. 
And so they concoct this story, they kill uh, a goat, they put the blood on the coat, and they take it back to their father. And then Jacob again is deceived into believing that Joseph is dead. So here we have Joseph, 17 years of age. He's been sold off into slavery. He's taken to a foreign land and to a foreign culture. And the scripture says he was sold to Potiphar, who was the captain of the guard for Pharaoh. And so he gets sold into Potiphar's house, and Potiphar begins to put him to work. Now, Joseph doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. He doesn't wail against the Lord. He doesn't rail against the Lord. But Joseph decides to put his hand to productive work while he waits for the Lord to deliver him. And so he applies himself diligently, and God gives him favor in the eyes of Potiphar. And before long, Joseph is elevated to second in command within that household. Here he is a slave, and Potiphar has put him in charge of everything. In fact, the scripture says the only thing that Potiphar concerned himself with was what he was going to have for dinner. So Joseph works for him 10 years. He's elevated to a position of authority, even though he's a slave. And perhaps in Joseph's mind, he was thinking, well, maybe this is what God has called me to. Maybe this was, the, this was my deliverance. Maybe this was my position of leadership. But it wasn't meant to be. Scripture says that Joseph was an attractive young man. And Potiphar's wife had noticed. And on many occasions, she had tried to get Joseph to sleep with her. She had enticed him to come to bed with her. And yet Joseph wasn't having any of it. In fact, he told her, you must be out of your mind. How could I possibly do this? My master has put me in charge of everything in his household. The only thing he's withheld from me is you because you are his wife. How could I do this to my master? And how could I sin against God in this way? He was having nothing to do with it. But Potiphar's wife was relentless. And eventually she has her chance. The day comes and she sends all of the male servants out of the household because she knows Joseph is coming in. And as he comes in, she grabs him and says, now, our, now is our chance, come sleep with me. Joseph is horrified and he flees. And as he's running, she grabs his clothes and pulls them off of him. She takes his cloak as he's running. Then she calls all the servants back in and claims that Joseph tried to rape her. Her husband comes home, she tells him the same story. And scripture says that Potiphar burned with anger. Now it's interesting, scripture doesn't say that Potiphar burned with anger against Joseph. It said that he burned with anger. And you have to think that Potiphar had some indication of his wife's character. That perhaps this wasn't a complete surprise to Potiphar. That perhaps he knew more than the story that his wife told him. But because of his position, and because of the rules of society at that time, Potiphar had to do something. And so he throws Joseph in prison. I have to believe that in that day and time, in those circumstances, had Potiphar really believed that Joseph had tried to rape his wife, he would have had him killed. But he doesn't. He not only puts him in prison, but he assigns him to the head jailer. And scripture says that God had favor on Joseph, and he gave him favor in the sight of the head jailer. Once again, Joseph doesn't whine, he doesn't complain, he doesn't blame God, but he applies himself diligently to what needs to be done. And the chief jailer recognizes this, and before long, he puts him in charge of the VIP prisoners. There's two prisoners in the jail at the time, the cupbearer and the chief baker for Pharaoh. Somehow they had offended Pharaoh, and there they were in prison. The cupbearer was an especially honored role this was the individual who would take a sip of something before Pharaoh would drink it, so that if it were poisoned, that person would die of the poison instead of Pharaoh. But both he and the chief baker are there in prison. And Joseph tends to them with great care. In fact, he comes in one day and he notices that their faces are downcast and he asks them, why are you depressed? What's wrong? And they tell him, we've had a dream and we don't know how to interpret it. And immediately Joseph says, interpretations come from God. Now I want to tell you that that doesn't just happen. If Joseph had not consistently been walking with the Lord, he would not have been able to respond immediately in the way that he had. 
Had he been wrapped up in his own self-pity? Had he been wrapped up in, in feeling sorry for himself or being disappointed with God because not only was he sold into slavery, but now he was cast into prison for something he didn't do, he would not have seen the opportunity and he would not have been able to respond in that manner. But he did. He said interpretations will come from God. And so they tell him the dreams and Joseph is able to interpret the dreams. He tells the, the, uh, the chief baker, he says, sorry, but you're about to lose your head. And he tells the cupbearer, it's good news for you, you're going to be restored to your position. But he tells him, only when you get restored, please remember me, because I'm languishing here in prison for something I didn't do. Please remember me to Pharaoh. So the cupbearer gets, gets restored to his position, and the head baker did lose his head. Uh, but the cupbearer forgets to remember him to Pharaoh. In fact, Scripture says it was two full more years before Pharaoh has his dreams. So now Joseph has been in this land for 17 years or for 13 years. He served Potiphar for 10 years in his household. Now he's been in prison for three years. And all this time, Joseph doesn't whine. He doesn't complain. He doesn't blame God. He doesn't... He doesn't lose his faith. He continues to trust God. It's as if he got up every morning and said, Lord, perhaps today is the day that you'll deliver me. But if you don't, please show me something that I can do to put my hands to work so that I may be productive while I wait for you to deliver me. If only the children of, of Israel had had the same attitude. And so Pharaoh has these dreams and he calls in all of his people his heads of state, members of his cabinet, and nobody can interpret his dreams. And as he's being upset about this, the cupbearer is nearby, and he approaches Pharaoh, and he says, Oh, Pharaoh, today I remember my transgressions. You see, when I was in prison, I had a dream that no one could interpret, and there was a young Hebrew boy there who could, and he interpreted my dream, and exactly what he said was going to pass came to pass. And so Pharaoh gives the order for Joseph to come out of prison. And so they pull Joseph out of prison and they bring him before Pharaoh. And so Pharaoh says this to Joseph. He says, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So once again, Joseph's heart and his head were in the right place. He was able to respond immediately and give glory to God. And in fact, he was so tuned in that he knew prophetically that the answer that Pharaoh was going to get was an answer of peace. So sure enough, Pharaoh tells him his dreams and Joseph tells him what's about to happen. There are going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and the seven years of famine are so bad that they're going to consume everything that was gathered in the years of plenty. And immediately, Joseph begins to outline a strategy for how to deal with what is going to come. And I believe that it's at this moment, when he comes before Pharaoh, that Joseph realizes that this is what God had called him to, that this was God delivering him, that this was his opportunity to fulfill that for which God had called him to. Notice how he goes immediately into outlining the strategy because he knew that this is what God had called him to. And so Pharaoh's response is phenomenal. He says to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? So you have Pharaoh in Egypt, and this is a polytheistic society this is a culture that believes in many gods. Pharaoh himself was worshipped as a god. But here he is acknowledging the God of Israel, giving glory to God because of Joseph's faithfulness. And so Joseph was placed into a position of authority. In fact, he was made second in command of Egypt. You could say he was the prime minister of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. In fact, Pharaoh put him in the second chariot and rode around the major cities so that everyone could see that Joseph was second in command. And nothing in Egypt got done without Joseph's approval. He was second only to Pharaoh. 
So Joseph institutes the plan that he'd outlined to Pharaoh, and he winds up saving that region of the world from death and destruction from the great famine. And you might think that that's it, but God wasn't finished because there was an important work of reconciliation that had yet to be done, and that involved Joseph's brothers. So eventually, in the midst of the famine, his brothers come to Egypt to buy grain, Joseph recognizes them, and eventually reconciliation takes place with his family. His father is still alive, and so Jacob and all his household come from the land that they're in, and they settle in one of the most, uh, the best pieces of land in Egypt for, uh, for raising sheep and raising goats. They're put into this very fertile land where they become fruitful and multiply. And in fact, they become so numerous that these are the people where the story begins in the children of Israel and their exodus. Joseph's impact was so powerful that the story of the exodus begins with this verse. And there arose in Egypt a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. It's amazing what a tremendous impact that Joseph had. On the one hand, we see the children of Israel who never give up their childish ways and their childish ways of thinking and they condemn themselves to becoming prisoners. Instead of entering into what God had called them to, instead of walking in their purpose, they marched in futility for 40 years around the desert. Joseph, in contrast, kept his faith in the Lord, kept his trust in God, and was elevated to a position where he saved an entire region of the world. So in conclusion, we have a few takeaways. First of all, God owes us nothing, not even the fulfillment of his promises. Hebrews 11:13, after naming all the wonderful people of faith in the Old Testament, makes this comment. All these people died in faith without having received the things they were promised. However, they saw them and welcomed them from afar, and they acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Things were promised to them that they never received in this life, but they saw them from afar. And as we said earlier, the very definition of faith is decreeing and declaring and seeing something in the spiritual and knowing that it has substance and believing by faith that God is going to pull that out of the spiritual into the natural. But it didn't happen in their lifetime. And the very things that they saw in the spiritual that they didn't receive, you and I have received. That is, the restoration to our position of righteousness through Jesus Christ, and also the restoration to our position in rulership, the position that Adam had before the fall, so that now we are in a position to fulfill the calling that God has given us and to walk in our purpose. The second takeaway is that we are created for God's good pleasure. We're not created for our own pleasure. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, for we are his workmanship, having been created in Christ Jesus for good works that God prepared beforehand so we may do them. God has created us for his good pleasure. And the third takeaway is this, that God is good all of the time. If you don't get your mind wrapped around that, if you can't get yourself in a position where you're committed to that, you are not going to make it through the difficult times. When the questions come up, you will get frustrated and you will doubt God's goodness. And the only way to get through that is to be firmly committed in your heart to knowing that God is good all the time, that he has a purpose for your life, that he will cause all things to work to your benefit. And that is what gives you the strength to get through and helps you to maintain the right position and the right alignment with the order of things. And the final takeaway is this, that we are more than overcomers. Romans 8.37 says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And how can we be conquerors and overcomers unless we have something to overcome? In fact, it is through the process of overcoming that we demonstrate our rulership. So the trials and tribulations that we think are here to harm us are actually given to us by God so that we can learn to exercise the rulership that he's given us. And through that process of exercising that rulership and learning to walk in the identity that God has given us, 
we begin to elevate ourselves to the place where we indeed cause the kingdom of God to manifest on earth as it is in heaven. So the question for you today is this, would you rather remain a, pr a prisoner or become a prime minister? And if you don't like your latitude, it probably has something to do with your attitude. Thank you. Hey everyone, I hope that you enjoyed the message today and the online ministry that has been provided for you through Embassy Christian Center. We just really want to be a blessing to you and we hope that it really blessed your heart. Right now we want to take up an offering for the ministry so that we can continue to do what we're doing. And as you know, our vision is bringing life-changing restoration. And part of the way that we do that is because we are really committed to training people how to do and operate in the ministry. We want to train people in the prophetic and many other areas and arenas and everything that God has called us to do. So by your giving, you help us continue to support us to be able to continue to be kingdom building people. So we're asking for you to give your best and we're praying for you. Understand, we know what it's like to struggle. But my wife and I, we personally know what it's like to struggle. We've seen God do supernatural things through our giving. So we want the same thing for you. And I'm going to pray for you that God does supernatural things for you on your behalf, on behalf of your finances. And I know God hears our prayers. And as we join together in prayer, God is going to move supernaturally on your behalf as well. So, uh, one thing that you have to do is this. If we're given online, you can click the link below, or you can text the word GIVE to 210-880-9841. That's 210-880-9841. Follow the props you can give to this ministry. Now I want to pray for you. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just speak blessings, Lord, your financial blessings. Father, I decree breakthrough, Lord, to these people, Lord, that are watching right now. And Lord, for everyone that is sowing a seed, Father, I just bless you for them, God. Lord, that you will move supernaturally on their behalf. Lord, just like you did for the widow that Elijah went to, Father, that she gave her last. But, Father, because she gave her last, God, you kept providing for her continually. Lord, the grain never ran out. Father, I'm asking you to do the same thing for these people that are hearing and listening right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, bless them, God. Touch them, Father. Move by the power of your Holy Spirit, God. Move every demonic hindrance that have touched their finances right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, I decree and I declare breakthrough on their behalf. Father, I rebuke every demonic enemy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray an open heaven over everyone that's listening right now. Father, let your blessings bring forth, Lord, your greatness and your goodness, God. Lord, I thank you, Father, for not withholding any good thing from them, God, and that they will see the blessings of their sowing. In Jesus' name, 